And welcome everyone to the Eat, Drink, Explore Radio Network's Market Fresh Hour. I am your host, Randall White. It's now 33 minutes past the hour, and as always, fantastic to have you here with us today and hope you're learning a lot about uh, the foods and beverages that uh, make up your life and uh, hopefully you're getting some tips that will uh, help you work some more nutritious foods, some more local foods, some more sustainable foods into your uh, diet and your regimen. Uh, This portion of Eat, Drink, Explore Radio's Market Fresh Hour is brought to you by Sidecar Restaurant in downtown San Luis Obispo. Okay, so they're located on Broad between Higuera, everyone knows Higuera, and Marsh Streets. Now, Marsh is a one way that runs the opposite way of Higuera, and so it's uh, right there in the heart of downtown. And whether you're considering going to brunch or, you know, maybe Thursday after the farmer's market or during the farmer's market, Sidecar really should be at the top of your list. Uh, Sidecar has a constantly changing seasonal menu with some favorites that get carried over, including their amazing roasted Brussels sprouts. I cannot give those a big enough thumbs up. And a wide array of vegan and vegetarian dishes, plus plenty of meat for the omnivores out there as well. Sidecar Restaurant, you can find them online at Sidecar. S-L-O.com. So sidecarslow.com. And when you go in there and get seated, let them know. You heard about it on the radio. All righty. It is uh, time now to uh, talk grains. And last week during this exact segment, we talked about a giant barley bank in Germany. You remember that? Where scientists are studying how climate change will likely affect how that grain is grown around the world. Really interesting discussion. Well, this week we keep the on the subject of grains, uh, but we're bringing it much closer to home uh, to some fields along California's central coast where a local farmer is specializing in heirloom grains and uh, really wants to be the provider of that for his local community. John De Rossier, or De Rosier, rather, uh, with with the grain is on the Market Fresh Live Line right now and uh, joins us. Hey, John. Hi, Randall. Yeah, nice to have you here on the program. You know, in all honesty, I can't remember where I heard about your program, but uh, I looked it up quickly and I was like, oh, I got to get this guy on the show because uh, <laughs> you and. In- after reading more about you then, when I looked you up online, I realized you really encompass a lot about what this show tries to present, and that is how we can be sustainable in our own backyards. Yeah, well, well, grain is, is the foundation of the food system in a lot of ways. I mean, between grain and pasture, you know, these are the, these are the basic uh, pieces that really mobilize the, va- the mass number of calories that we have in our diet. Right, so yeah, true. grain is key. When did you get into grain? Because you, I mean, it's fair to say, right? You are really into it. <laughs> oh, I'm really into grain. That's more than fair to say. I actually got into it as, um, pretty much as a teenager, really. Um, got in it. I wasn't from a farming family per se, but um, I uh, got into it through food. Uh-huh. I was looking for, um, you know, I was really a, a, a foodie, really young, and and then I started, you know, wanting to grow my own food, and I did some, you know, gardening and that kind of thing, and I was one of my um, uh, my mentors suggested that I try growing grain, and I hadn't any, you know, ever ever tried it. You know, I wasn't really around it or anything, and and I was absolutely captivated. I was just so mesmerized by it immediately that it has just continued to um, be a big part of my life. And that was, oh, you know, that's um, quite a while ago now. <laughs> you know, that's twenty years ago almost. You know, yeah, so, it's not something uh, that know. the rest of us really have a lot of experience with. You know, uh, just about any backyard farmer has tried their hand at tomatoes you know yeah. zucchini is a real common one uh but when it comes to grains we usually just leave that to the professionals and buy it yeah. already baked as bread yeah and you know it's it's a actually it's a really kind of tragic illusion because when you look around the world uh people that are growing food for themselves regardless of the size that they have even if it's just a little tiny plot and they're subsistence growers they grow grain because this is the massive collection of our sunlight energy that we can store and keep and really feed ourselves. And we have somehow, um, you know, got the mindset that, you know, the only way to grow grain is in, you know, 100,000 acre right. blocks, you know, in the middle of some flat territory. And that's actually totally not true. Um, and more so, the, uh, 
the food grains, which uh, we can talk a little bit more about that, but mm-hmm. they are ideally suited for small-scale agriculture. They oh. really, really do well with hand, um, hand methods. Um, they're highly productive. They resist all kinds of pests and diseases quite easily, and there's thousands of varieties. And so it's, you know, it's, it's just this kind of un, untapped resource, and um, it's something that, that is absolutely mesmerizing to work with once you kind of get going with it because they're fantastically um, <laughs> amazing plants. Yeah. They're really, they're very human-tuned. They're I mean, grasses, they, right? Grasses, yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. So they're so so grains are um are the seeds of grasses. Exactly. Grain is the seed of a grass, and it's a special kind of seed. Um, I mean, in a, it's kind of a oversimplification, but if you think of like a peach, and you have the the outside of the peach, you know, the inside center fleshy part that we like to eat, then you have the seed. Well, in a grain, all of that is kind of fused together. Oh, okay. And so when you eat the grain, you're eating all those parts, and that's one of the reasons why it's so nutritionally dense. Unless we've stripped them and bleached them to the point that they're white flour, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. When you when you do that, you take the bran off of the outside, and the germ, which is the oily part in the center, is um, is removed, and then you just end up with this uh, basically the endosperm, which is the kind of the um, kind of the fleshy part of the peach. Yeah. Then you know you you lose a lot for sure. John, as Americans, have we gotten too hyper focused on uh, just a few specific grains like wheat, barley, and rice? Yeah, well, you know, there's uh, two ways to kind of look at that. One is for sure we've kind of narrowed in on a few varieties, but if we look historically around the world, you know, most cultures haven't had the option to buy wheat, barley, rice, rye, triticale, oats, you know, amaranth. I mean, they, you know, that's a pretty recent. Um, you know, luxury that we have to be yeah. able to access all those grains. But what we have focused in on is um, some very specific traits. And as we did that over the last half century, especially, we have radically eliminated the diversity. And there are literally are, you know, thousands of varieties, and we are just growing a few. And, and that's where and your heirloom culture comes in, right? Ex- exactly, exactly. And um, a lot of it, and this is one of the untold stories of grain, is is buried. I mean, when we have selected for these really, you know, new characteristics that we like because they fit the modern agriculture, we um, we've lost a lot of the, the the cultural information that goes with these grains. I mean, this is thousands of years of human human handling. Yeah, you know, thousands and thousands of years of individual people stewarding these varieties for food for their sustenance you know not just like casual entertainment or cash crops but survival you know what i mean right yeah they're tuned tuned to people's characteristics you know and people tune these grains for certain traits and so you know they're very very um culturally intertwined with with people and when you go to um some place to get a variety because you want to try something different you know oftentimes it's just a number you know, P2, feet, you know, 5778. <laughs> right. That's it. And that's all you know. You know, and you, it's like that. It's it's like if you bought a tomato like that, you look up your tomato catalog and you're like, you just buy it by the number. You know, is it indeterminate? Is it determinant? Is it red? You know, is it a sauce tomato? Is, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and that's exactly how I gone. buy my grain when I do the bin shopping. You know, I, uh-huh. there's a number I have to write on. <laughs> On the, exactly. on the little tag, 3302, you know, make exactly. sure. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like that. You know, we order uh, we order uh, seeds from seed banks and stuff, and a lot of times, you know, ho- hopefully we can get the right geography, um, you know, the geographic region that they come from, whether it's, you know, the Middle East or some other place, you know. But th- the cultural information and the true magic of these grains is really really getting cut out if, if basically it all, it's almost already cut out sounds entirely, like a good documentary but, is in the works oh this is i mean this is really the base of so much of our civilization yeah. and there's definitely good you know conversations to be had around you know grains being modern food versus you know like the you know the meat diets and you know a lot of uh, it's different concepts about that but you know it's i mean if you look around you will absolutely 
find everywhere that grain is used because it is such a massive storage of sunlight energy. Yeah, civilization's oldest cocktail is beer. And what does that come from? <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> Grain, you know? Yeah, exactly. Hey, John, as we know, California is just ripe for growing just about anything. And uh, I imagine that applies to grains as well. And you uh, work the land on several plots throughout mostly San Luis Obispo County or exclusively San yeah. Luis? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. San Luis County. Um, and it, exactly. The, California in general is amazingly perfect for growing a lot of different varieties of grain. And um, the thing is, is that we, again, have to look back into our into our history to find the varieties that really work here. A lot of the hard red winter wheats, which is what most people buy when they buy a loaf of bread, this mm-hmm. is, you know, by and large, what you're getting is not necessarily suited for California growing. It's it's not necessarily the kind of grain that um, it is very drought tolerant and it does do well here. But there are certain characteristics about it that um, are really suited for more of the Midwest. And our elevation is not high enough, right, for quinoa? No, actually, we can do quinoa here. I grow oh. some quinoa, and um, there's a lot of varieties. And and you know, again, it's uh, you know, it's a matter of just finding what it is that you want because the grain has been growing for so long in so many places that you, pretty much everything is out there available. I mean, there's grains that are tolerant of salt water. There's grains that are high elevation, low elevation. You know, hard frost, no frost. I mean, it's 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 pretty much been done. You know, and that's kind of why I feel like the. Uh, the really hardcore selection that we're doing right now for the massive farming hey, environment. Is- hey, John, can yeah. can I hold you through the commercial break? I only sure. had you scheduled for one segment, but I want to continue this. Okay. <laughs> All right. We're yeah, speaking no with John DeRossier. He's with the grain. We're back in just a moment. This is the Eat Drink Explorer Radio Network. All righty, welcome back to the program, everyone. 49 minutes now past the hour. You are listening to Market Fresh, part of the Eat, Drink, Explore radio network. And as we always like to remind you, there is a whole extra hour of great discussion about food, beverages, travel, tourism, Sundays 9 to 10 right here on this station. So that is coming up. And uh I don't do this very often, but we held over our guest from the last segment because he just had so many great things to talk about. I couldn't let him go. <laughs> and he was in the middle of a discussion about uh, the different types of grains that can grow here in California. And it kind of blew me away. I had no idea quinoa could be grown here. Uh, I talked to a couple of different quinoa companies, one uh, located in Colorado and uh, one lo- one importer down in Southern California who flat out told me uh that California just does not have the climate for it. And uh, and so I thought, well, that's really a bummer because that's a big part of my diet and I like to be a locavore. So um, I guess I'm just always going to have to import quinoa. But according to our guest, uh, who is with with the grain, and that's with thegrain.org, very easy to uh, find online, uh, John... DeRosier, and I don't know why I'm having such a hard time with that, John. I apologize. Welcome back to the program, sir. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> so uh, we had just, I just asked you the question about uh, about quinoa, and you were getting into describing how each uh, variety of grain has so many variations itself. Yeah, and so the, you know, the real uh, trick of it is not necessarily is it possible to grow it here, but the you know, the real component of it is how the economics work into it. And a lot of that has to be the larger scale, you know, model to really get it out. Yeah. But again, like kind of going back to what we were talking about, that, you know, when grain is, when we think about grain on a smaller scale, a lot of these things become possible because the varieties are already out there. And if, um, if the mass, um, you know, the local, uh, locavore movement and, and foodie, you know, people can start thinking about grain as part of their food, it can be grown. Yeah. And it can be grown really well here. And, it, and, you know, the other thing that's, you know, kind of an illusion about grain is you really don't need a lot of area. I mean, because you can feed a lot of people on an acre. You know, I mean, you can get, you know, a, a 500 pounds, 1,000 pounds, 2,000 pounds. Wow. I mean, you, rice. Uh, it's grown, you know, up in the Central Valley. They get, you know, almost 10,000 pounds an acre. 
Whoa, yeah. You know, so when you're talking about, you know, needing hundreds of thousands of acres, you really don't need that much. You know what I mean? Yeah. You just really need the environment and the skill set and some of the seeds that are appropriate for your area to produce it. And it would fit ideally into some of the rotations that are already needing grain rotations for like small scale, um, you know, vegetable growers and, you know, these these kinds of things. I mean, the grain would fit right in, but it's, you know, it's an economic component. And when we're used to really cheap, cheap commodities, it's hard to make that switch in our mind that, you know, okay, this, this flour that used to cost me, you know, 20 cents a pound is now going to cost me a lot more per pound. You know mm-hmm. I mean? That, that's a, that's a, a concept that we need to have, you know, <laughs> we have to value our food. discussion about, you know, right. yeah, because it's, that's a highly, highly subsidized price right. and it's subsidized on many levels. And it, it, you know, it, it's just not something that, you know, a, a, a new farmer is, is going to just pick up and go for that price. You know, you just can't, you just can't do it. There's and a so, lot of things, food included, but uh, I, also water comes to mind and, um, absolutely. and power well, or, that we I get mean, at a price that just <laughs> is really. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, this is the other piece that I find really fascinating, which is the environmental component, you know, and, you know, we do a lot of things with grain that are are not smart in terms of environmental decisions mm-hmm. when we don't have to. For example, durum wheat is grown in the valley, and that's uh, irrigated. You know, up to 48 inches of rain, you know, four-acre feet of water is put on some of this durum wheat. And durum wheat is one of the most drought-tolerant wheats out there. Oh. I mean, you can grow durum wheat on four or five inches of rain. So why do so we overwater we it? Irrigating it. What's that? Why do we overwater it? Uh, economic. Oh, okay. Because that's, that's what people will pay. I people see. will pay for cheap water and the infrastructure to put it in, and we subsidize that as a community, as a state. We subsidize that, yeah. and then they use that cheap water, and they produce this crop that's then subsidized, you know, <laughs> for all of its other components in the fertilizer and everything else that we pay for in terms of our environmental costs, and then it ends up being this really cheap food. But it's it's not, yeah. you know, it's not that cheap. It's just hidden. Hey, John. And, speaking of uh, yeah. economics. How do you get your product out? Um, because you're not just growing it for fun. <laughs> I mean, you no, are growing no, yeah. it for fun, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, most of my stuff is all direct customer. I have a CSA program um, that um, is it's very similar to like a vegetable CSA where mm-hmm. each week people get a box of vegetables. Where in my case, I do every other week. Um, I do uh, grain um, in various forms. I, I, I mill, I make flour, I roll, I make cereal mixes. Um, and so every other week I deliver packages of grain and, um, and I basically go throughout the season because, you know, once the grain is harvested and it's stored and it's, um, protected, then, mm-hmm. you know, it's not gonna, it's not gonna like, you know, like a tomato it's not oh, gonna right. bad real yeah. quick. Uh-huh. So I can distribute it over a period of time. And the key is, is that I can make that fresh because that's grain is highly, highly, uh, susceptible to going rancid because it has so much oil in it. It's right. six, seven, eight percent oil. So you mill that flour and immediately you're already beginning to oxidize a lot of the minerals and it'll make it, um, you know, very, very susceptible to going rancid. So, so people I mill my, Oh, I'm sorry. Ahead. You could continue. Yeah. I was just going to say, I, so when I do my CSA, it's like either within a, you know, less than 24 hours, they're getting it from the mill onto their, you know, onto their home. Wow. So, you know, it's like, it's a, it's a diff, totally different product and the flavor is there and, um, you know, all that nutrition and, and, um, just <laughs> the, yeah. the, the, the good part about the grain is just there because it's so fresh. And so, uh, right now people can on your website, contact you via email to set up some sort of, uh, shipping or delivery or a pickup with a CSA sort of thing. And you, exactly. And you do have plans as well to uh, maybe start visiting some of the local farmers markets in San Luis Obispo County? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm interested in getting into the farmers markets. And a lot of it has to do with, um, it's just been, you know, building up my 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 rotations and my yeah. supply and getting out to that volume, you know, because it's, right. definitely, it's definitely a, a missing component of our community. But there's a lot of pieces behind the scenes for me with, you know, leasing land and getting the rotations right and all this kind of stuff. I'm certified organic. So, um, Oh, you know, on top of it all, that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm, you know, I'm really interested interested in the biodynamics. I've been um, Demeter certified biodynamic for a number of years. I've just put that on hold for a bit because I'm adding new acreage, and it takes time to get it into biodynamics. But yeah. it's all still certified organic, and um, so lots there. 
I'll say, and more. We'll have to have you back on to talk about the education component and also a kitchen that you uh, operate as yeah, well, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. So, John, we'll have to do that uh, down the road when we have more time. Um, okay. I should just devote a show to you. <laughs> you have so much information. <laughs> uh, John DeRosier with the grain dot org is uh, how you find him online of course we will provide a link at eatdrinkexplore.com uh, with more information John thank you so much for joining us today thank you thank you very much all right everyone that does it for us for this hour of market fresh as always keep it here on this station Sundays 9 to 10 for our Sunday fun day hour talking food wine craft beer travel and tourism. I'm your host, Randall White, reminding you to always keep it pesticide-free, local whenever possible.